welcome right, well everyone. Done. This is Virtual South Summit, and today it is about sustainability. Now, sustainability in normal times was considered by most people a value. Today, it is the flavor of the month. And we have an amazing jury and some eight amazing startups. They're gonna show you what sustainability and entrepreneurship have to do together. So let's begin. Maria, how are you, Maria? Hello, Paris. It's great having you here because you are you are not our MC. You are the greatest MC and the greatest uh, per person. Thank so you, Maria. Here I want to welcome everybody. I want to welcome from here, from Spain, from Madrid, from Wow Room, from IE University. So thank you to all of you. Maria, um, this today we're talking about sustainability. Talk to me about sustainability. Has our relationship changed with respect to sustainability over the last three months? Well, I think Paris that sustainability in the last years, in the last months, uh, before the pandemic, it was just yes, a great issue to all of us. But I think that from this, after these uh, three months that we have with the pandemic, I think it's much more. I think the value we really give to sustainability, to keep on our planet, to keep on everything that really is our lives, is really key for all of us. And I think that you've said at the beginning that this today, this week, with sustainability, we have the biggest, the, the uh, more people in our jury because of the companies, all the, the, the different uh, investment funds are really interested in, in sustainability because it's key for all of us. And you know what? This year in South Summit, when we were going to do just the traditional South Summit, our key subject this year, not only subject, the way we were going to do South Summit was yes, focus and based on sustainability. So you had a bit of a crystal ball there, Maria. You knew what was going to happen, or what? <laughs> I never have. No, not me, of course not. But I don't think that doesn't exist. But anyway, I think it's very important that we are all here today to talk and to identify really good innovation and good projects about sustainability because it's key for our lives, it's key for all of us. Yes, and uh, today I'm here also representing IE University, who is the partner of South Summit. And I'm not sure if it was vision or what, but the fact that IE University created the Center for Health, Wellbeing and Happiness last year, I think is a major uh, thing, initiative, that the timing could not have been better. Today, we're living in an environment where many of our students are focusing on sustainability more than ever. Uh, we had a situation last week where one of our students essentially you know, got up in front of a very big company and said, you know what? Sustainability is not something you can give lip service to. You need to walk the talk. So thank you, Olga, for that. Um, and now we're gonna continue with our um, event. And as I said, we have an amazing lineup, and we're going to start with our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker uh, is the head of sustainability for one of the biggest telcos in the world. Uh, the telco is from Saudi Arabia. It is called STC. So Maha al Nuhait is going to speak to us about sustainability. Welcome, Maha. So while we're waiting for Maha, uh, just a few uh, pieces of uh, facts here. Uh, this year, surprisingly, um, and I'm not sure if it's surprisingly or not, but for the first time in the history of the entrepreneurship area, we have a record number of startups, of people doing uh, startups during this <clears throat> COVID-19 pandemic. And what's amazing is the number of startups that are focused on sustainability or giving back to society. Uh, and we think that's going to be a trend because social entrepreneurship 
is going to become a way of life for many people. So we're going to start. Okay. All right. So let's begin. <clears throat> we're going to start <clears throat> now with a competition. So before we begin the competition, <clears throat> let me explain to, them, to you how this is going to work. Uh, we have an amazing jury, as we said, one of the biggest that we've had, actually the biggest we've had in the virtual South Summit. And they're going to evaluate the startups on the following criteria. Innovation, scalability, viability, team, and investability, investor readiness. Uh, we also have a private room chat where people can network with the startups. So let's begin. Our first startup. This startup is from Brazil. Uh, it is a Brazilian biotech company applied to new materials development that has created the most efficient oil absorber, absorber in the world. Representing this company is Guillermo Pinedo de Quireus. He is the founder and CEO. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming BioSolvit. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Guilherme Queiroz. I'm the founder and CEO of BioSolvit, a Brazilian biotech company applied to new materials development. I'm here today to talk about water treatment and oil spill accidents. Almost 6 million tons of oil were spilled in the last five decades, only our seas according to ITOP. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you the BioBlue Natural Absorber. Uh, I'm simulating a uh, oil spill accident, okay? Here we have two tanks and we are putting crude oil in these two tanks in the same quantity. In the first tank, we use polyurethane, the best alternative for this kind of accidents before us. In the second tank, we use our product, the BioBlue Natural Absorber. One kilogram, one kilogram of polyurethane on the left absorbs 12 kilograms of oil in 30 minutes. One kilogram of our product absorbs 22 kilograms of oil in only 15 minutes. Besides being the most efficient, our product is natural, made from palm fibers discarded. And the most important, this technology is the only one that allows the reuse of spilled oil. So we can recover the oil from the sea or land and put again to refine. See the difference between these two tanks. I went to France and Total has challenged us to test our product in the said Institute of France. That's the result. Nowadays, we are the number one in oil absorption. Some competitors from Germany, United Kingdom, and from United States. And some products we produce, containment barriers as a complementary line, absorption barriers, kits for industry sports, airports, and mines mining companies and that is the reason because our market size is so large 145 billion dollars in 2019 our revenues last year 1 million dollars and our projections to 2023 285 million dollars we have just closed out our series a 3.75 million dollars here in brazil and we have been preparing our company to raise 25 million dollars in the next years. We were accelerated by plug and play in United States too. And that's our team. I'm from Totus, the first Brazilian unicorn. Wagner is the man behind the innovation. Giuseppe, an important executive from Telecom Italia. Habib, our R&D director. And Fantini, our raw material supplier and our uh, industrial director. This team can change the world, believe me. Actually, between making money and save the world, we choose both. Thank you very much. Okay, you heard it. Bio solve it. Time for Q&A. All right, jury. Any questions? Fernando, floor is yours. Hello, thank you. Uh, congratulations for the presentation and for the project. I think it is very interesting. Uh, you mentioned that you can recover the oil, and then what happens with the with the fiber? Uh, because I think it is great that you use this cardboard uh, fiber, so it doesn't contaminate, and you have a second use for it. But what happens with the fiber once you recover the oil? Yes, um, 
the fiber must be discarded as the oil uh, with another absorbers. Uh, the most part of absorbers in the world must be incinerated by after use. And our product has the difference because we can recover part of the oil, actually 95% of the oil, and then we can discard only the product that we have used to, to absorb the oil, you know? More Q&A, okay. Israel. Yes, thank you. Uh, congratulations on the project. Could you explain to me a little bit of what what is there that you have patented or, or intellectual property on? Is it the process? Uh, is there a special formula that you use and how it is protected? Okay. Thank you by the question. Uh, we have the patent here in Brazil, in the United States, in Canada, and in the European community, okay? Just very quickly, is it a process that you patented or, or, or what is in, it? In the United States, we have already registered, but in Europe, the answer, uh, the process is ongoing, okay? Okay, thank you. Next question, Laurent. <laughs> Thank you, Guillermo, for the presentation and congratulations for your project. Regarding your market approach, what is your go-to-market strategy? Um, we sell our products to oil companies um, or even to small repairs, you know. We have a network, a network of distributors here in Brazil. We've been opening a new operation in Houston, United States, and we are trying to find some partners to join, to, to, to walk hey, with us in Europe. I think there is something wrong because we can hear you, but we can't hear the questions. I don't know if there is some, some problem with the audio. Yeah, we've been... Guillermo, we can't hear you now. Sorry. Okay. Uh, our market strategy is to sell our products uh, through the network distributors, okay? We are a B2B company and we sell our products to oil, uh, large oil companies or even to small repair, for example, okay? Okay, thank you, Guillermo. Uh, Judith. Uh, mute, Judith. Sorry. Yes. Now? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, how you identify the oil spills in the in the sea? Is the is the your client or you have a partner network for that? Uh, our clients identify the accident. We we only sell our products to remediate this kind of accident. You know. Okay. Thank Christina. you, Christina. Hello, Guillermo. I, I was wondering how secure you have the raw materials, no? How easy are these materials, to, the, the raw, your raw materials to, to get? Are available worldwide? Uh, do you have large suppliers or do you have to go to small suppliers in order to get this, this raw material? Yeah. Brazil used to discard more than 200 ton, tons of this biomass every month. And our industry discard about five tons by day of this product, you know? And we have the raw material inside our company because our partner, Fantini, is um, the CEO and partner in uh, Natu Palm. It's a heart of palm industry that discard this kind of palm fibers, okay? Thank you. Okay, we're going to have quick go quickly through the next three questions we got here. Uh, Silvia, you have a question quickly, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, congratulations for your project. I would like to know uh, if you have a solution, a focus solution for soil spills and not only on liquid. Sorry, I can't understand you. Soil, uh, yeah. Yeah. When you have a spill yeah. on, on soil, not only in liquid, do you have developed a solution for yes. that? Yes, actually, only 5% of the oil uh, spilled in the world 
uh, used to be spilled in the ocean. The most of the oil uh, spilled used to be in the in the in soil, and we have filters, pillows, um, and many other products to solve this kind of accidents. We attend, uh, we sell our products to airports, uh, highways, mining companies, um, auto repairs because of that. And we have a system filtration to clean the water from the process of exploration, petroleum exploration. And that is our uh, main product, okay? Okay, thank you. Javier Villamizar. Uh, how scalable is the process to transform the biomass into the product that you will sell in order to to perform the 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 absorption okay. of the spill all we the oil spills need only 2.3 2 kilograms of our product to clean uh 100 liters of petroleum and we have I'm asking about the, manu the, the manufacturing process, right. the transformation of the biomass. We have two industries here in Brazil your with about 2,000 2, meters to produce this product. Okay. And it's something that is Sorry? easy to replicate? It's yeah, easy to replicate easy. if you want to scale the it? The production process scale? is very simple. And that is the most important part of our, our product. This is a, it is a, um, a great innovation with a simple um, production process, okay? Thank you. Final last question quickly, Jeffrey. Thanks. Um, do your customers buy your product and hold it in inventory in case of a spill or do they only buy it when they have an accident? Uh, there are two ways to connect to our clients. They use to put these products in our, uh, in their, um, in their, I don't know how to say in English, but in their places, in their sites. And we have um, a part of this product with us in the case of accident, you know? In a just in time, uh, uh, supply model, okay? Okay, thank you. Got to move on. All right. Our next startup is thank a technology you. leader for air quality sensors, data, and analytics. From Germany, represented by Robert Heineke, co-founder and CEO. Join me in welcoming Breeze Technologies. Hello everybody, my name is Robert Heinecke. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of Breeze Technologies. We are an industry leader in air quality sensing, data, and analytics. Air pollution has become the greatest environmental health threat of our time, according to the WHO. But still we don't do enough against air pollution because current sensing technology is built on paradigms from the 60s and 70s. We have those big bulky monitoring stations sitting on our roadside, highly expensive. One of those can cost up to a million euros and because of that, cities only have very limited of them. Hamburg, for instance, where we are based, a city of 1.8 million people, has 15 monitoring stations. Based on that data, they are making decisions about their cleaner actions, and of course, this does not work. This is why we have developed our own lower cost air quality sensors that are measuring all the different components of urban air quality. And we have moved all the complexity of traditional sensing to software to the cloud. We use artificial intelligence to plausibility check, and calibrate the data that we get from our sensors and are reaching accuracy levels in reference studies up to 95% uh, compared to the existing monitoring stations. We have sensors that are 50,000 times smaller and 1,000 times cheaper. And this for the first time enables us to provide ubiquitous air quality data from the urban landscape. And this is what we do as Breeze Technologies. We provide comprehensive real-time air quality data, automatically analyze it, in real time and provide recommendations about the most fitting, that is the most efficient and effective cleaner actions based on a catalog of three and a half thousand that we have sourced globally. We provide this together in a subscription bundle together with our environmental intelligence cloud where we have the uh, analytics capabilities. And for citizens completely for free, we also run a global citizen platform where you can see how does the air quality look like in my neighborhood. Please feel free to check it out. 
Um, in the future, we want to also enable other industries to use our data. Imagine a sports app that tells you where's the healthiest running route for you based on your current location and current air quality levels. Or when you're looking uh, for a new apartment, you might be interested, what's the average air quality like in the street that I'm looking at? This we will, will enable through a future API uh, together with partners. Um, our team is currently 11 people. We are based out of Hamburg. Um, we've been called one of the most promising startups in the EU before in the hemicycle of the European Union. And here are some of our select customers. Due to the time constraint, I just want to go into one of them. Together with the company Microsoft, we have launched the world's densest air quality monitoring network in the city of Hamburg, um, where we are looking at correlations between hyperlocal traffic data and hyperlocal air quality data and how those two um, affect each other and what we can learn from that. If that sounds interesting for you, we work with governmental institutions and we also work with industry, putting our measurement networks around their production facilities. And we also do indoor air quality for companies like SAP, where it's about employee well-being and health. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Feel free to hit us up. Being and health. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Okay, time for Q&A. Questions, people. All right, Israel. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, very quick and efficient. But can you can you just show me an example? Can you tell us about an example of how your technology is working, whether it's a government or, or private industry? So uh, and exactly how you uh, you have measured that uh, uh, example of uh, of working. Um, yes, sure, I will be happy to. So um, together with the environmental NGO NABU, we are measuring um, emissions in the Hamburg port area. And um, there basically we correlate the uh, data from our individual sensors with wind and weather data, and also the AIS ship movement data, which is also publicly available, to then figure out which ships are causing how much emission in the port area. And this can then be used potentially also by the harbor police and other institutions to do checkups on these ships, for instance, following SECA and NECA regulation. Okay, thank you. Mariana. Hello, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was reading in your brief, in your summary, that you not only measure air quality, but you also recommend uh, effective and efficient solutions and that you have more than 3,000 of, of those. Can you give us a couple of examples of those types of solutions that you can recommend automatically? Yes, basically um, you can cluster these recommendations into uh, the ones that are enabled by data. Um, some examples for that is, for instance, um, controlling traffic flow based on data. If you have a smart city system that is capable of rerouting traffic throughout your urban landscape. Um, or um, for instance, incentivizing public transport like the cities of Brussels and Paris are also already doing based on current air quality levels. But there's also a lot of different um, static um, uh, air, uh, clean air actions that can be implemented. For instance, using photocatalytic asphalt when you build new streets or sidewalks to take pollution out of the air or installing moss or algae walls in the urban landscape to, to clean air. And we have similar recommendations then also for indoors where you can, for instance, paint a wall with titan oxide and also take pollution out of the air there. Thank you. Diego. Diego, you have a question? Okay, uh, Cristina Aparicio. Hello. Uh, I... Okay, Marta, you had a question. Yeah. I... Hello. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Uh, sorry. I think we got Cristina, uh, Cristina. back. Hi, Cristina. Okay, sorry. I was more mute. I was I was asking about the value proposition, how different is to other ones, no? Because censoring is something that is already out there, and also monitoring platforms is something that even the governments are using, no? So, which how different is going to be your value proposition in order to fight against the the current and the current solutions that are are outside? 
Um, yes, there is a lot of different sensing solutions already out there, but cities are struggling with two points. Uh, the one is the accuracy. So um, there's a lot of different projects out there where cities are really struggling to, to get accurate data. And they, they do it for three months and then they, they get rid of the system again because they're just not uh, satisfied with, with the accuracy. And we already now maintain uh, air quality monitoring networks for a couple of cities for more than two years. So they're really satisfied with the solution. And um, leveraging that, it, most companies are actually only then focusing on providing the data. And we go one step further with our recommendations to actually be a full provider of um, not only air quality data, but also recommendations for cleaner actions. So we help them. Um, it's, a, it's a fully digitalized uh, business model comparable to what companies like TÜV, for instance, are currently doing as engineering offices in consulting work. Okay, thank you. Uh, Diego, can you hear me now? Uh, you had a question, Diego? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? No, I think the connection's really bad. All right, we'll come back to you, Diego. Marta, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, Thank thanks you. for the presentation. I have one question uh, regarding the, the where you are uh, installing your platform, apart, apart from the initiative in the Hamburg port. Do you have real initiatives in cities? Um, yes, so as, as mentioned, a couple of cities have contracted us to run their air quality monitoring networks. Um, that includes uh, cities in Germany like Neckarsulm, Merz and Hennef, um, but it also includes cities abroad. We have one in Austria. Um, we are working with the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. They are also one of our customers and we are also working with the US Department of Homeland Security. Okay, thank you. All right, last question, moving right along here. Uh, Javier Gonzalez, you read me. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, one question, uh, are you involved in the development process or do you, in order to ensure that the performance and optimization of the solution or do you rely completely uh, on No, the our solution, um, so our sensing solution is completely developed in-house, both hardware and software. We have the capabilities for that in our team. Um, in regards to the clean air actions that we recommend to our customers, these come from partners but we only take cleaner actions into consideration where there's actually white papers and studies from independent research institutions that verified, uh, that have verified that these work and how much they work. And we also work with a very limited amount of these providers to do unpaid projects with the cities. So for the cities, it's for free. And then we measure with our sensors how well the cleaner actions are performing and provide that data then also to the solution providers. Okay, I apologize, but we're way out of time. So we're gonna continue. Uh, our third startup is a startup that wants to create a world where carbon is a sustainable resource to shape the future of humanity. From Canada, Natalie Giglio, the business development lead, is gonna present. Join me in welcoming Carbling, Carbon Upcycling Technologies. Hello. Hello, my name is Natalie Giglio and I work for Carbon Upcycling Technologies, where we take the pollution of today and make the materials of tomorrow. Every action and activity we do has a carbon footprint associated with it, which totals 34 billion tons of carbon dioxide emitted into our atmosphere each year. And 40% of those emissions come from buildings. And by 2060, our built environment will double in size. So instead of leaving all that carbon dioxide out in the atmosphere, we envision a world where materials are derived from carbon dioxide, and that will shape the future of humanity. We have developed a patented process in which CO2 is sequestered into inorganic solid powders. This is like a sponge permanently soaking up water, but instead of water, we soak up CO2 into powders such as fly ash, bottom ash, graphite, talc, and other powders, which creates different products that improve the performance of concrete, coatings, and plastics. While using fly ashes in the concrete production is not a revolutionary idea, we have revolutionized a commonly used additive that now makes sustainability easy in the construction industry. And it's not just easy, it's effective. Our concrete additive reduces cement use by 20%, creates 40% stronger concrete, and therefore reduces the cost of concrete manufacturing by six or 10%, as verified by Lafarge Wilson. 
This past year, we won Fundacion Repsol, which has allowed us to scale our graphite-based plastic production, as well as we recently partnered with two New York-based companies that recycle glass, and now we are undergoing testing with them as well. We truly believe that carbon can be used positively to impact every facet of society. Our concrete additive is our primary focus in our scale-up efforts, and as a result, our potential greenhouse gas reduction is approximately one gigaton per year. We outperform our competitors through a single step, low energy carbon utilization process. We keep costs low by tailoring our batch run process to non-peak electricity hours and using inexpensive feedstocks. With that, we have created a plug and play technology that keeps the concrete supply chain intact. Over the last five and a half years of operation, we have scaled our reactor from the size of a cookie jar to now producing eight tons of our product per day with plans over the next 18 months to scale to over 50 tons of product produced per day. Our incredible partners have been instrumental in our success. Last September, we won the 76 West competition and became the only carbon utilization company in the NYSERDA portfolio, and will start up operations in New York later this year. We are rapidly scaling our technology and demonstration for the Carbon X Prize. Collectively, we believe in diversity, integrity, innovation, and curiosity. And together, we believe in accelerating change by using today's waste to build tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Okay, time for Q&A. Christina. Hello, Natalie, thank you. It's a very, very interesting uh, solution. No? My only question is that uh, you rely a lot in flyers and flyers is a byproduct that uh, is not difficult, it's not easy to get, uh, especially during these days. And it's something that is going to be scared scare, uh, in the future, no? because the thermal uh, industry is closing, especially in the developing countries. So how do you envision your, your process or your, pro your end product uh, with the, having this in mind? Mm -hmm. So if we get all of the fly ash converted using our technology, that's a win for us. And obviously, like that industry is narrowing, right? But we are experimenting with other powders as well, like natural uh, posilines, like olivine, talc, uh, and other natural minerals like that, that we enhance with our CO2. And we're seeing um, enhancement pro properties similar to that that we're seeing with the fly ash. So there's lots of different materials that we can use through our process and get similar results that we can add into um, different industries like construction or plastics or consumer products. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey. How do you compare against competitors like Carbon Cure? Yeah, so um, what we do is we make it really easy to integrate into supply chains. We basically put in an additive that they're already adding. So. If there's no extra technology that has to be incorporated into the pouring of the concrete, it's simply the additive uh, in the mixture of the concrete that that company is already doing. So our ease into the supply chain is what really differentiates us and makes us very scalable in comparison to somebody like Carbon Creek or, or Carbon Cure. Thank you. Sylvia, is that your hand up, Sylvia? Okay, that's from before. Great. Uh, Javier? Yeah, I saw a few, um, you know, uh, casual restaurants and, and food um, outlets in your user space. Can you explain um, how, how, how you interface with them? Yeah, so we have another product line. Um, it's an alpha carbon coating and it's a corrosion coating. So basically what that does is we have a novel spray gun process that coats the, in, uh, the inside of grease interceptors or other water waste tanks. And so by having that uh, alpha carbon coating enhanced with the carbon dioxide, it gives it extra barrier properties. And so we did a, a um, pilot project down in Florida uh, where we coated a lot of those tanks for those fast food restaurants and those sort of big industry players. Okay, thank you. Last question from you, Judith. Yes, hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, could you explain me what is your uh, sales and growth strategy and how you um, approach customers? Yeah, so right now we do mostly deal with B2B to either concrete manufacturers um, or directly to businesses who use 
uh, these additives in their products. But um, as we are sort of growing and commercializing, we're looking towards licensing. And so licensing our technology out so that people can enhance fly ash and other materials on their own sites to have that um, distribution network um, larger on a larger scale. Okay, well, we've got some extra, a little bit of extra time. Fernando, you had a question. Yes, thank you. If I understood well, you need to build a reactor near the uh, place where the CO2 is produced or where you have the fly ash to uh, produce the, the end material. So uh, how scalable is the project? I mean, uh, what is the investment you need uh, to, to build a reactor in every place? And then what is the payback period, for instance? Yes. Yeah, so basically with the um, reactors that we do, so a company would license it out and we've built models where um, different variables are, are priced in. And so, you know, in each region, it, it's very slightly, um, but you're seeing the return because by using these sort of enhanced materials, you're lowering the manufacturing costs um, across the board. So you, they are seeing a return quite quickly um, by using um, one of our reactors on their site through our licensing program. Okay. Thank you, Fernando. All right, moving right along. Our next startup, this is our fourth one, so we're just about halfway there, uh, is a blockchain-based marketplace that aims to solve the needs of offsetting CO2 emissions of corporations, supporting sustainable projects worldwide. From Spain, Francisco Benedito, who's the CEO, is gonna present Climate Trade. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. My name is Francisco Benedito and I am the CEO of Climate Trade. Well, Climate Trade was born back in 2018 to disrupt the carbon markets. And why to disrupt them? Because carbon markets uh, created back in 1997 were a, a new solution to decarbonize the world. Well, until now, corporations polluting companies, uh, they were supposed to pay for pollution because they are the ones that are polluting. So carbon markets creates a system where the pollution companies will have to pay to companies that do the opposite, companies that generate green projects worldwide. And that green projects avoid or mitigate carbon emissions. And that carbon emissions are uh, measured in a tone of CO2. It's certificate that they give to that companies is one certificate of, of uh, one CO2 tone, one carbon credit. So that carbon credits are sold to the polluting companies. So one tone emitted by one tone avoided equals zero. So with our technology, we want to provide carbon neutrality to these companies. So we put in contact directly uh, these companies with the providers, offer and demand, and we offer other third party services that they need to achieve carbon neutrality. We use blockchain technology and why we use blockchain technology? Because of traceability of funds and transactions, we provide more transparency and obviously, because if we eliminate intermediaries to be able to provide the exact number of funds to the project developers, the right number of funds, uh, we need to prove that, is, that this is uh, done in the right way. So we need blockchain that is immutable. We automatize the process. It is more automated. We reduce cost in approximately 30% and the user experience is gorgeous, as you can see. Uh, our projects are some of the most recruited worldwide. Anyone with a recruited project can upload the project in our platform, but it has to be certified with, by some of the governments or the most recruited standard brands worldwide. If not, we don't accept it. Well, uh, our API is a prolongation, an extension of our platform. So what we do is we connect our platform with your systems, the system of the companies, to provide also carbon neutrality, carbon compensation, to their customers and to the providers. Why? Because in the next 30 years, every single transaction in the world is going to be carbon measured and carbon compensated. So an example, you can see it in Iberia Airlines. Well, we, start, uh, we started since January already. You can compensate as a, fly, as a, a customer of them uh, in your flights, whenever you buy a flight, you can calculate and compensate the carbon footprint of your concrete flight, a specific flight, and you receive a certificate in your email. Finally, our team is a multidisciplinary and complementary team from different fields, scientists, commercial, IT, and uh, communication and marketing, and I am financial, I'm from the financial world. So and in 2018, we were recognized by United Nations as the best solution in the, in the carbon markets worldwide. 
Well, the solution, it has uh, be shown that it is not public anymore. It's a public and private solution and everyone needs to achieve carbon neutrality. So we are the tool for it. Thank you so much. Okay, there you heard it. Climate trade. Time for Q&A. Laurent. Francisco, thank you so much for, for the presentation and congratulations for your project. What is your main competitive advantage versus other players? Well, basically, uh, worldwide, uh, there were other carbon markets. Uh, these were uh, carbon platforms. This was created in 1997, but uh, the capable of trace transactions and trace uh, like funds to towards the end. And obviously, we eliminate that part, which is the intermediary, and so we reduce the costs. Uh, that's one of the main advantages. And the other one is that we, we have a very powerful commercial and IT team that we can adapt and, and customize our solution to any company that requires it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Path. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, how do you approach customers? Um, what's your sales strategy? What is our sales sales strategy? Well, I come from sales. I, I've been working for 15 years in, in, in the financial world, in the commercial financial world, in a bank. So basically, we we use all, all type of, of strategies available in the market, in the point of social media, CEO, uh, sale, uh, like all LinkedIn, uh, all the types of different, and obviously, our most powerful part is our commercial team. Today, I think that a company needs has or not doesn't have commercial team if you don't have a commercial team you 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 cannot get success so we have a very strong commercial team and we have a lot of experience on that field so obviously we start from we started in 2018 cold door and and now uh, the the customer acquisition rate is is much much lower uh, at the very beginning uh, we have already three years experience so at the very beginning it was very difficult but now uh, it is much easier I Thank, know you. I the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Israel. Thank you. Um, yes. What, what is what, what is the reason why a, a company will buy your services? What do you value offer? Is it reputational? Is it to show the customers that they're doing something good, or is it an actual impact? Are they conscious of this? Or, or, or are they just jumping on a bandwagon? Tell me the, 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 the value yeah. of, of, of your project in comparison to the others out there and why yeah. and who well, makes the, that decision. All the companies today, they, they want to achieve carbon neutrality. Most of them, they are the most advanced one are already two years making provisions in their balance sheets to achieve carbon neutrality. And the companies today and most of the ones that are here uh, know already, all of them are looking at to achieve carbon neutrality before 2030. Why? Because your consumer and because not only not because it's going to be mandatory, it's because your consumer and your investors are going to make it mandatory. As you can see, 10 of the biggest coal companies in the world already became bankrupt and all the oil companies are in a run, in a rush to achieve, uh, to become not oil companies anymore and to be renewable companies mixed with oil companies. Because if not, they are not going to invest in their stocks. So that's, that's a rush for that. So if you go to carbon neutrality and you have a broker that offers you two projects or three projects, and then you don't know if the price is the right one, if he controls the project, if he's just putting much price on that, we, we open you the marketplace. This is at eBay. You upload your project and you can see thousands of projects. You select your project, you have your backend, you have everything there. So, and, and at the same time, you buy directly from the origin. You don't have to buy from a broker. So obviously it's much, much cheaper. So that's, uh, it's like a, it's like a disruption and a marketplace disruption like in all, any other market. Okay. We got time for two more questions. Javier Martinez de Rojo. Yes. Hello. Hi, Javier. You are setting quite a, an impressive both in terms of revenues in your business plan for, for this year, probably postponed to next year due to the COVID. But anyway, my, my question regarding this is, uh, what is the main risk uh, that you see in order to achieve in this uh, 
high growth for for the for the for my business or for the sector for my business for my business for your business obviously uh, our business has to we started as a startup two years ago so uh, we have to scale up properly in the right markets and obviously we are facing competition but we are leading the market so obviously uh, it, it, our only risk is to to raise the the right funds at the right moment at the moment we are doing it properly and we are growing the company properly so we have the the right team and 80 percent is team and for me now uh, it's not only team but it's team and and and, and power of scaling as, as commercial as i told you but obviously you need the, the funds to be able to scale it up uh, properly i don't know if i answer your question javier Okay, let's do two yes, more questions you. very quickly, please. Jose Minguez. Yeah, I got one question. You know that the CO2 markets are very, very regulated. We, we are buying CO2 and we buy them to the, to the brokers. So I don't think that this is really very much expensive than other possibilities. And the, and the second is more technical. How do you manage the blockchain? What value add to the blockchain to, to all your prospects? Well, uh, I, I don't, uh, I mean, in terms of, of the brokerage, the brokerage is more important in the EU ETS market, not for the voluntary market. It's totally different one thing from another. So uh, it is very important for the sustainability manager to know the projects, the value and the quality of the projects, because the, if not, if you buy one project from, from one broker and you, you don't make the due diligence, the proper due diligence, then you can have problems because they can accuse you of greenwashing. And that's a big problem that the companies are facing also. I don't know if you remember the case for EasyJet recently in, in UK that they were accused of greenwashing because they just spent 27 million pounds on, on 2.5 pounds ton a ton. So it was too cheap for the market and they had very big problems in marketing uh, in, with the press. So, I mean, it is very important to, to be able to see different projects, not only the few ones that the broker offers you, and there is not a market that you can see at the moment all the projects that are available in the world. So that's that's for the UTS is 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 mandatory, but not for the voluntary market. So and and your second question, blockchain. Uh, for me, and I guess for anyone that knows blockchain, blockchain allows you the possibility of uh, tracing every single transaction and to prove it. And if you are sending money to and you say that you are sending money to one provider to Guatemala, and you cannot prove that, uh, the, the world is gonna transform it in transparency and everything has to be transparent. And if you can prove it with blockchain, that's the, the, the biggest solution you are bringing is that you are providing solution uh, uh, transparency to this market also with blockchain, also traceability and automatization, obviously, but traceability and transparency are the most, the, the most important parts of the blockchain. Thank you. Okay. Uh Mariana, we got time for a very quick question, please. Sorry. Okay, hello, thank you. So the question is about um, thinking about your your usage. You said in 2019, you were able to um, get 20 companies and also 300 individual users. And I was wondering what is your type of service or, or connection with individual users or what do you mean by that yeah well uh, we can, we at the moment as, as you saw we are working more than at the moment with more than 25 corporations and more than we have more than 1000 users approximately um, so what we do is that we offer our solution as as we have an internal IT team and already as totally experienced with this uh, we integrate our solution with the different companies we work with for example, uh, Iberia, as I told you, uh, we, whenever you, you search for a flight and you, you buy a flight, you can compensate it. So that customer, obviously, is that individual customer I'm talking about. Okay. Well, that does it for uh, that last startup. Now we're going to go to our fifth startup. This startup is a platform that helps companies understand, measure, and manage their social and environmental impact. From Chile... Javier Graterol, the CSO, is going to present. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Quantix. Hello, Todd Summit. My name is Javier, and I'm excited to talk to you about something that needs no introduction in this challenge. 
We're all aware of how social and environmental problems are shaping society and are changing the way we do business. In fact, these problems are pushing us forward to create a better future. Believing that business and capital can be a force for good is actually a global trend. For example, BlackRock committed to have all their portfolio integrated with the ESGs. This trend is growing at 41% each over year for investors, and each day, more and more NGOs and corporations are aligning their goals with the SDGs. However, the question most organizations have is, what's my impact? How is my organization changing people's lives and fighting climate change? There are some great organizations and initiatives out there that are working hard on bringing light on this issue. Still, more than 74% of investors measure with their own indicators and methodologies. This is the purpose of Quantix, where an impact measurement platform that automates the process works with real impact indicators in a flexible way to deliver comparable data of true impact. To give you some examples, in KPMG, we help them quantify how voluntary work affected productivity. And with Google, we help them rank and monetize the positive effects of their social investments in LATAM. How we do this? Our process in four simple steps. We design a measurement plan, we gather the data, analyze it, and communicate it. Our online customer support helps you pick the correct indicators, and we have a bank of more than 1,000 that gives you the right question to ask how to ask them, providing you with comparable data. Then we provide you with the right tools to collect this data with automated bots and a range of channels such as Facebook and WhatsApp. And finally, we generate automated reports that are easy to communicate to the organization stakeholders. Our business model is fairly simple. We charge a one-time onboarding fee for each project and an annual fee for the use of the platform. The competitive landscape today is filled with partnership opportunities, since most of them are consultants organizations that will take great advantage of our software. Our market is very interesting. We tend four types of organizations and we estimate that our Latin market is a total of 11 billion US dollars. We have had an amazing ride since 2018 with more than 320,000 US dollars in sales and more than 50 clients in nine different countries. And even during COVID, we're growing in clients and sales as of last year. This has only been possible with our team that sounds more than 80 years of experience combined in impact measurement, sales and tech development. This event and its participants are doing an amazing work. You guys are creating impact. We just want to help measure it. Shall we begin? Okay, time for Q&A. Diego. Uh, can you hear me now? You hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you perfectly, Diego. Okay, perfect. Uh, my, my question is about, you have a general framework for measurement or do you develop for each uh, specific client? And, and a related question is, have you been uh, validated or accredited by any institution on your framework? Thank you, Diego. Um, more than, uh, we have a process that is uh, the one I showed you in, during the pitch. There is the, this onboarding to get you to design and, and, uh, and select the right indicators that you're going to use during your measurement process. And then we give you the tools to actually collect this data, which is one of our main differentiators that we collect uh, end data to, to the end user or, or beneficiary. And regarding the validation of our, of our framework, we've been validated with the, the, the clients that we have and the clients that we work and the, and the results we have with them. Uh, I don't know if that is uh, a validation enough for a, for a framework, let's put it that way. Okay, thank you. Uh, Emilio Martinez. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, when you say about impact, basically you are uh, focusing on social and environmental impact. Or what do you see, what, what are you trying to measure when you say impact in general? Well, uh, we, we define impact as the, as the last stage of what you're going to measure. And depending on the project, you can have projects that have social impact or environmental impact. We just we have the the process to allow you to get that data of, of, of 
that final step to to actually know how you're changing people's life or how you're impacting the, the environment. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, Marta. Hi, thanks for your presentation. My question is, do you follow or support any international standard? Yes, uh, we have, we work with, uh, with IMP indicators, we work with uh, IRIS indicators. So we have different frameworks inside of a platform. We just allow you to, our indicators that are based from other frameworks and some indicators that we have developed ourselves. Uh, the key differentiator from that is that we give you the indicator and the questions that you're going to ask and how you're going to use them. So we provide you with the whole set so you can actually implement a measurement project, not just get the indicators and, and leave you alone to, to figure out what to do there, which is one of the things that we have, uh, we have found that uh, companies, investors, they, if you give them just the indicators, they still don't know how to implement or don't know how to collect that data. Okay, thank you. Okay, Marius. Hello, congratulations on your project. Um, uh, sustainable investors and stakeholders uh, each time are more interested in the sectorial impact of, of depending each sector. So this, this looks like a integral platform of ESG issues. Are you planning on integrating eventually each sectorial topics that uh, which may be more than 62, depending on the different frameworks. So are you planning on making it more sectorial so companies can really measure their material impacts? Yes, thank you. Great question. Uh, in a roadmap, we're planning to integrate more, uh, more frameworks and processes. One of them is uh, to actually give you a platform to, to measure and manage all your ESG indicators. That is, uh, uh, we're planning this going to come next year. And uh, so, so yeah, we're continually growing our indicators. We're continually growing our frameworks uh, to have Quantix as a base of you want to measure your impact. Yeah, we, here are all the tools that you're going to need to actually do it. And here is the support that is going to, to allow you to implement a good measurement process. Okay, Susana. Susana, are you there? Okay, we'll buy some time here. Sonia Fernandez. Yes, hi. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Really interesting. Do you have an interest also in focusing on asset managers, like going to the financial sector and measuring the impacts, um, you know, ESG in portfolio for portfolio managers? Or, or is it more focused on, on the corporate themselves? Thank you, Sonia. Uh, one thing that we have discovered during these uh, years of business is that uh, the asset managers are there. It, it's, it's a great channel to reach other organizations and to reach uh, even uh, companies itself. So we're planning on developing a solution for, for the asset manager that is going to be focused on ESG. In fact, we had some conversation about it with um, one of the biggest asset managers in ESG in, in Brazil this year. And uh, we're going to incorporate that as a, as a means to an end, as to, to create value for them, but also to allow us to get to a bigger bigger market opportunity in terms of, of corporations itself. All right, thank you. Uh, let's try one more time. Susana, are you there? Susana, I think the connection to Mexico must be pretty uh, busy right now. Okay, we're gonna move right along. I don't think we're able to connect, right, Susana? Can you hear me? No. Yeah. Okay. Moving right along. All right. Our sixth startup today is a startup from India, and they are pioneering the circular economy for reusable food delivery containers in India. Join me to welcome Shashwat Gangwal, the founder of Infinity Box. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'm going to tell you about Infinity Box. We were selected as one of the top 50 startups across the world by Hull Price to join their accelerator program in 2020. So what is it that we do? Our solution is quite simple. We are here to replace each and every single-use plastic container that is used to deliver food with reusable, recyclable, and food-grade containers. 
the single use plastic is a burgeoning problem across the globe and over 36000 tons of single use plastic is generated just by food delivery just in india this is expected to grow by 3 to 5 times in the next 4 odd years and we want to replace that with a minor tweak to the existing supply chain we want to provide the users a toggle option on their existing food delivery apps which will allow them to opt in for infinity boxes and then return them via multiple ways the first of them being our patent pending infinity bins we placed in societies and offices and the users can drop their containers in there or giving it back directly to the delivery executives who will come back to deliver another order who can then drop it up in smart bins then we'll collect them from these uh, from these bins take them to our partner kitchens uh, where we'll get wash them through ensure that they go through a thorough hygiene management process and then return to them to the restaurants so infinity box makes uh, every stakeholder of the value chain better off by providing restaurants better quality food grade containers at a cheaper or equivalent price delivery containers get an e eco friendly tag and are in line with the changing regulatory scenario consumers get a platform to contribute to the environment on a daily basis and the environment benefits with the reduction in single use plastic every year our proof of concepts across the country have been wildly successful with a staggering 75% adoption rate and with us being able to collect over 95% of the containers that were used in the pilots the market opportunity is huge with over 6 billion orders expected to be placed by 2033 but we are quite confident that we'll be able to capture our target group uh, by uh, our target group and that is because our delivery partner which is the largest food delivery aggregator in the market which is swiggy holds about 45% market share and if we are able to capture just 0.1% by 2023 we can accelerate with a perfect uh, with the perfect operations post that after having worked with the financial team and uh, on our information we realized that just a minor point uh, 10 cents charge per order to the consumer and collecting the packaging charges that the restaurants already collect we'll be able to break even by quarter 12 and be unit economics positive by quarter 7 next steps would essentially be integrating into the swiggy app getting access to the 100 million plus consumer base and providing them an alternate solution for eating uh, in an environment friendly manner and with our projections we'll be able to reduce over 300000 kgs of plastic by targeting tier 1 high density urban population areas we have been supported by multiple uh, organizations across the board and we are a team of young entrepreneurs uh, from premier institutes across the country and have worked with multinational corporations and we are here to seek your support to help us grow and eliminate single use plastic from the from the world okay you heard it from infinity box and now for some q and a uh diego um congratulations a great project um but my my question is are you seeing any pushback for from consumers because of the fear of covid-19 uh you you're muted can you hear me now yes Is Sorry. Hi, thank you for your question. So, we've conducted multiple surveys and focus group discussions and hygiene management as you pointed out isn't a concern that has just come about due to covid. Obviously it has been enhanced, but uh the idea is that we use dish uh, we use sanitizing liquids and we use disinfectants which takes care of any potential uh microbial uh you know like any potential concerns around any infections or micro microbes present in the containers so it might be a concern in the short term especially due, due to covid but given that our target group is not the entire population but environmentally conscious consumers in tier one areas uh, we don't see it as a very uh, big challenge okay thank you israel yes thank you um just going on with uh, exactly how your business model is is been evolutionized and disrupted by the recent situation what has been your new plan on expansion uh the majority companies are are, are reducing the hq size some of them are quite happy for people to work from home this will affect uh, uh deliveries uh, to to corporations but i see it with the machine that you have there that you probably your clients are more uh, corporates than individuals So how is your uh, segmentation and and where do you get your market from? 
Um, thank you for the question. So, uh, as you rightly pointed out, uh, the smart bins, the infinite bins that are patent pending are basically going to be placed in societies and offices. But uh, the the major proposition that you, the, the major argument that you're proposing is that deliveries will go down and uh, re reverse logistics will get affected. So, we have actually seen an increase in uh, uh, like orders being delivered, which not just respect to food because people aren't going out to eat, but people still want to eat food uh, outside. So, the, the number of orders are expected to increase, but what is actually aiding us is that our partner, uh, the largest uh, aggregator, is also delivering other products like FMCT staples. So the number of times that the delivery guys are visiting the office, the households, has increased. So reverse logistics cost will go down. Yes, we haven't, uh, we, we don't exactly know, I can't give you the numbers as to how it will pan out because we are still under a lockdown in the city of operations in Bombay where we are. Uh, but when it goes down, we based on the information that we have from the operations team, uh, the reverse projects cost should actually go down. Okay, thank you. Ricardo. Thank you, quite interesting. Um, two good questions. How do you manage the logistics from the containers back to the restaurants? And how much and who do you charge? Got it. So if I get, get, got the question correctly, how do I manage the reverse logistics back from the consumers washing it and then back to the restaurants? So and the second is, what is the unit economics per order? Sure. So um, we essentially, so the smart bins, the, there's a reason we don't follow marketplace model that directly connected from the consumer and take it back to the restaurant because that's just ineffective in terms of economics. So everyone, either it's the delivery executive or the smart bins that are placed in societies, people are, uh, every container has a QR code, so you can just put it there, or the delivery executive is put it in the smart bin. And what that allows us to do is give us a two, three hour fixed window in the morning or at night when it's, there's less traffic. Uh, streamline uh, operations, you go and collect it, take it back to your partner kitchens where they're washed, and the next day they're delivered. What that, what that makes us do is you have to maintain double the inventory just in case of, you know, like there being a delay in terms of washing, but very low fixed cost, so that's not an issue. Second point, as to how much do we charge the, the, the consumer, so we charge a minor 10 cents per, uh, additional per order, and given that we're targeting environmentally conscious tier one consumers, that's not at all uh, hurdle for them. But the other source of revenue is that the restaurants already charge uh, 10 to 15 cents to the consumer as the packaging fee. So for every order that is delivered in an infinity box, we take that. So our revenues essentially go up to around 30 to 35 cents per order. And uh, in the beginning, uh, so the, the idea is in, in 12 quarters, you won't be able to reduce your delivery fee because people will keep getting more and more wages. You'll be able to streamline your operations, reduce your kitchen costs by having your own kitchens, uh, which you'll be able to manage with scale, and hoping that people will move more towards uh, smart bins as a way of disposal because fixed cost is always better than variable cost. So okay. we expect uh, 7 to, to be the place where we break even. Thank you. Sonia, quick question. Yes, I also had the question about the unit economics, and just out of curiosity, how how often can you use the uh, infinity box? Uh, does it have a limit as to that it becomes uh, you, you have to substitute the product? Like, what's the uh, maximum number so, of orders uh, that you can use it good for? Good question, right? So, so think there are two ways because of which you can't use the box again. Either you lose it, or it's there's wear and tear. So losing it is a probability that happens, but given that we're tracking each and every container with the app and the QR codes, we know, and penalty systems work in India, Uber, Ola, the aggregators, all the other platforms have shown that. So that, that is a way of keeping a track of each and container if that is lost. If there is wear and tear, uh, think of it as a Tupperware container, right? It's not a new container that you're taking out. It's a very high grade polypropylene container, which can last up to at least a hundred times, even in the worst of cases, if you're washing it with rings and so on and so forth. But that's why you use dishwashers to ensure, to in, ensure the longevity is higher. But in any case, the fixed cost per order that we're suffering is super low. It's always 70% of your cost will always come from your delivery guy going out and collecting the order. So fixed cost is never an issue for us. Okay, thank you. Very short question, Fernando, last one. Very short. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, don't you feel there is a strong competition coming from compostable uh, products that uh, you just have to throw it away and you don't have to care about logistics? Thank you. 
So I'll answer that question from two points of view, right? First is uh, the environmental perspective. The second is cost perspective. So if you talk to, so there are in this ecosystem, there are multiple stakeholders, not only the consumers, but there are restauranteurs and then there is the aggregate. For the restauranteurs, the cost of paper, aluminum, paper or uh, baggage, etc., is super high. They have they have to charge around ten to 50, uh, in in approximately ten to fifteen rupees per order to even break even. Uh, the idea is they can't pass on the cost to that consumer because consumers are now used to getting that food in a paper bag. So they're essentially suffering a loss. If when we are coming in and we are essentially charging the consumer more and the restaurant is getting the same amount that it was, it is economically beneficial for the consumers and for restaurant. For restaurant, yes, for uh, consumers, it is basically an environment consciousness that driving them to do this. Secondly, single use for, of anything, be it paper, be it baggage, is bad for the environment. Anybody uh, who is a circular economy proponent would tell you that making this, making any uh, paper, aluminum, etc., that takes up a lot of natural resources, produces a lot of gases. And given that the recycling system in a country like India is in shambles, uh, you they're not necessarily taken you know, back to recycling plants. Most of them end up, and Ellen MacArthur would tell you, like 14% in the entire world is recycled, um, would end up in landfills. So that is, again, you know, nitrous oxide, etc., emissions. That is bad for the environment. So that's just like reusable is a no brainer. It's just whether the consumers are willing to op opt in and adoption of more than 70%, given the very specific target group, tells you that they are. Okay, thank you. All right, moving right along. Our seventh startup today. This startup is coming from the US of A. It's a biotech that rescues food waste and re engineers it into sustainable fibers, replacing plastic in fashion, medical, and packaging industries. Robert Lewell, founder and CEO, is presenting my, no, me tarot. Are you tired of sending, Are you tired your, food tired of sending your food waste to landfill and polluting our environment? Well, I am. Hi, my name is Robert Lewell. I'm the founder and CEO of me tarot. When I visited my uncle's dairy farm in China in 2018, I was shocked to see buckets and buckets of spoiled milk sitting there. He was really frustrated and he asked me to help him out. That was when I first investigated the impact of food waste to our climate. In fact, one third of the food that we create around the world goes to waste every single year. And that creates 3.3 billion tons of greenhouse gases. Amongst that, 128 million tons of milk are being dumped. Food waste is a century-old problem, but there hasn't been a sustainable or affordable solution until now. My company, Mitro, is the world's only biotech that rescues food waste and re-engineers it into a system of protein fiber. What do I mean by that? First, we go through a pack and penny process called PROAC in which we extract the bad taste and protein from bacteria grown milk. Once we have the bad taste and protein, we go through another process called serine we created to purify this bad taste and protein into good taste and protein. Once we have the good taste and protein, it can be made into food again to feed people that are in hunger. But we don't want to stop there. We created a third step to spin the good casein protein into sustainable fiber right here. Currently, there are two types of fibers in the world, petroleum-based and plant-based. We're creating a third type of protein base made from food waste. Our fibers can apply to apparels like the one I'm wearing right now, bed sheets, face masks, and food packaging film. Our goal is to replace petroleum materials with protein-based materials made from food waste. We are redefining circular economy in which everything begins with food waste. We create sustainable byproduct from it, and at the end of cycle, MVP, everything can be recycled or biodegradable. We began as a B2C brand to validate our market, in which we generated over $100,000 in online sales to sell to 40 countries around the world in just nine months. This year, we're expanding the B2B part of our business to supply our fibers to other big corporations. We will license our technology when it is fully patented. We have 30 years of supply chain management relationship. We have filed two patents already, and we plan to file four more later this year. We are currently participating in Dairy Farmers America Accelerator, which is the biggest dairy raw milk supplier in the world. Our fiber is cheaper, biodegradable, and use 60% less water compared to organic cotton. Because of our unique technology, Nike has purchased our fiber and product to run our testing. We have also signed ally with HM, Ralph Lauren, and Richmond. We have a team that generates results. I have started three companies with two successful acquisitions. 
we have a team of PhD material scientists, chemists, and marketing experts. 50% of our teammates are female. We highly value diversity in our team. As for our future plan, we want to continue innovating about food waste. We're working on a separate technology that can turn whey, which is the byproduct of yogurt and cheese, into food packaging film to replace plastic. We're also working with vegan milk to turn it into sustainable fiber. Thanks to our innovative technology, food waste can now be re-engineered to replace plastic materials. Welcome to the future. The next time you see food waste, don't cry over it, just wear it. Thank you. Okay, you heard it, me Taro. Time for Q&A. All right, let's get some questions here. Uh, let's see, uh, Maha. Maha, you're in mute. We can't hear you, Maha. Okay, while we're waiting for Maha to fix the uh, technology issues there, Ricardo. Thank you. How biodegradable is this material? And is it currently uh, for use on CPG products? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? Can you hear clearly? Yeah, how biodegradable is the material? And is it uh, sustainable to use it on the food? Yes, yes. We're developing on a separate technology that can turn whey, which is the byproduct of yogurt, cheese, and ice cream production into food packaging film. It's biodegradable, it's edible, it's non-toxic, has a great gas and water barrier. So we can use that on food packaging as well. Okay, thank you. Diego. Uh, hi. What? Now, I'm curious about what the price of your fiber and how that's compared to other uh, fibers. You're asking for the price, right? Yes. Yes. So like, like what I show you right here, this is our fiber. It's cost lesser than Model, bamboo, and organic cotton in the field. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think we're good. Uh, no. Roberto. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. Um, have you identified some synergies with uh, plastic producers, uh, any other uh, plastic producer or the industry, in order to mix the processes so work jointly, in order to have another uh, an extra products? Thank you. Yes. So we're actually speaking with several plastic producers in the U.S. and Hong Kong to implement our technology on top of what they have already. So we, we want to help them out to make a transition because the market itself is demanding a transition from plastic. And we're providing a solution that can help them out, not to replacement entirely, but to help them out in the process and flow together. Okay. I think we're good. Uh... We're off to our last startup now. Yes, the moment we've been waiting for. This last startup is from the United Kingdom. It's a natural and biodegradable cellulose bead company, smooth on the skin and safe for the planet. Join me in welcoming Giovanna Laudicio, the CEO of Nature Beats. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Giovanna, the CEO of Nature Beats. In Nature Beats, we want to replace polluting fossil fuel based plastic micro beads with natural and biodegradable cellulose beads. Every year, more than 250,000 tons of plastic micro beads intentionally added to many products we use every day enter the environment and the oceans, and this corresponds to 20 billion plastic bottles and contributes 1.5 billion tons of CO2. Plastic microbeads are not just an environmental issue, they're also a market opportunity because they've already been banned in rinse of cosmetic products in many countries like UK, US, Canada. And now the European Chemical Agency is proposing to ban plastic microbeads in all applications. This means that many companies are currently actively looking for plastic microbeads replacement. 
Plastic microbeads are used in cosmetics and personal care products, in paints and coatings, in detergents, as fillers in composites, and many other applications. And the global microbeads market is 5.6 billion euros in 2020. Natural bead solution is to replace plastic with cellulose. Cellulose is a natural material. It is what trees are made of. It's abundant and renewable because every year the earth produces millions of tons of cellulose and it is 100% biodegradable. Natural beads, cellulose beads are the only currently available alternative to plastic microbeads that have the same performance in use as plastic microbeads while being 100% biodegradable. Natural Beads business model is to license the technology to mass manufacture cellulose beads. To do this, we've created an integrated manufacturing solution that combines hardware, processes, software, and we license it to specialty chemicals manufacturers, companies like DuPont, ESF, Axon Nobel, etc. We have assembled a very strong team with expertise in cellulose chemistry and membrane processing, which are at the core of our technology with my two co-founders, Janet and Davide. I bring my industry experience in DuPont and in technology commercialization and our principal process engineer with his work at Dyson has experience of taking inventions from concept to mass market. Natural Beats has already received funding in form of grants and investment to build two pilot plants for small beads and large beads. We are now looking for industrial partners to test our beads in their products and formulations, to test our pilot so we can accelerate the commercialization of our technology and prevent hundreds of thousands of tons of plastic microbeads to enter our oceans. Thank you. Okay, save the oceans. Time for Q&A. What do we got here? Okay, Ricardo. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your traction? I mean, uh, main clients, uh, a little bit more of revenues. Uh, yes, well, natural beads is, uh, is pre revenue. So at the moment, we have contact with manufacturers that are interested in our technology, uh, but mainly we are working with end users. So our strategy is to have our beads in different formulations. So we sampled our beads in a major company in cosmetic and personal care products, company in pencil coatings, company in uh, adhesive, uh, a designer who goes to make shoes by the So we are testing really in different applications. And then we expect that these companies will create a market pool for our technology uh, for the manufacturers. Okay, do we have more questions? All right, Mariana. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to understand your point of view around your competitive advantages uh, in the market compared with other similar um, initiatives. Uh, yes, yes. So, so the advantage of cellulose, 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 cellulose uh, already approved, for example, for using cosmetics because it's already used in fiber form. Uh, it is a very stable material from the point of view that it doesn't interact with, uh, with other ingredients. Uh, and the, the main advantage that we have is that we provide the cellulose already in the spherical form. So companies can use it really as a drop in replacement of plastic money. Uh, and in fact, we have received feedback that, for example, in terms of density, uh, dispersion, homogeneity, it's really uh, similar performance as plastic microbes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Laurent? Yes, uh, thank you. How are you protecting the technology that you have developed to date? Yes, yeah, so in our integrated manufacturing solution combines hardware, uh, which is protected by IP, we find the uh, patent and our plan is actually to uh, find more patents on the hardware part, because eventually we will not need 
the assembling company for the for the hardware part. Uh, then we have the process, which is our uh, expertise, which we can as a great secret because it's more difficult to protect processes. Uh, and then the software that makes the hardware and the processes work together uh, will be protected by both. Thank you. Uh, Javier Villamizar. My question is, uh, how limited uh, would you be in terms of supply um, well, for the cellulose? Cellulose is the, the most abundant biopolymer uh, on Earth. Every year, the Earth produces millions of tons of cellulose. And we are in contact with the biggest producer Okay, thank you. Last question, Fernando. Got it. Uh, thank you. Uh, probably this is related to the first question you got from Ricardo. Uh, in the documentation you provided, I understood that you are now testing it with your uh, with end users, but they should add as uh, prescribers to their suppliers, so their suppliers buy your product. So what is the initial reaction you have got from these uh, players, from uh, these suppliers, and what will imply to them to, to use your product? To you mean our direct customers or the end users? Your direct customers. Our direct so customers. So the suppliers of the end users. Yes, we have contact with manufacturers which are interested in uh, plastic up there. There is a big request because, for example, the capacity of PLA is completely sold out worldwide. And PLA is actually compostable, not biodegradable, so it's not suitable for the application. So there is a clear interest also from the manufacturing company to uh, find a replacement for plastic microbes. The challenge we have is that they want to see the bio. So they want to see the demonstration that the technology works. Uh, and this is what we are working on. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, that's it for the um, presentations of startups. So now the jury is going to deliberate, and they're going to tell us who the winners are a little later. But before we go on to our fireside chat, which is really exciting today, I want to give a special thanks to the jury members. We have Carlos Fish from Sia Ventures. We have Christophe Primol from Elia Partners. We have Dennis Kerpenstein from Faraday. We have Diego Sebrisky from Dallas Capital. We have Israel Pons from Angel's Nest. We have Javier Martinez de Rujo from Exxon Partners. We have Javier Villamizar from SoftBank. We have Jeffrey Char from JC Ventures. We have Jose del Barrio from Samay Pata. We have Emma Biasiolo from Beringea. We have Maria Sansigre from Demeter. Demeter. We have Marcus Gleim from North Zone. We have Oscar Ramos from China Accelerator. We have Ricardo Latournieri from AC Capital. We have Sonia Fernandez from Kibo Ventures. We have Susana Espinosa from Angel Ventures, Blanca Drake from Telefonica, Carlos Cruz from IBM, Cristina Aparicio from Semex Ventures, Fernando Impuesto from Enagas, Fernando Sandoval from Enel, Fernando Vallejo from Gobalvia, Francisco Javier Gonzalez Baeza from Acciona, Jose Mingues from Endesa, Judith Cruzent from GoHub, Laurent Arens from Sabadell, Mariana Hernandez from Google, Marius Calvet from Grupo Financiero Banorte, Marta Gil de la Oz from Sacir, Paz Nachon from Accenture, Roberto Jimenez from Repsol, and Silvia Bruno from Red Electrica. Yes, we've never had so many amazing jury members in one virtual South Summit. So let's give them a big hand. Now, it's time for our fireside chat. Uh, we're very fortunate today, and talking about sustainability, I don't think we could have a better speaker right now, but our next speaker is Tony Long. Tony is CEO of Global Fishing Watch. He became the first permanent CEO of Global Fishing Watch in 2017. Now, Fishing Watch, he's going to tell us in a minute, is the group that watches how many people are fishing around the world. So why is this so important? Well, we're going to find out right now. So let's get started. Tony, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. 
Uh, Tony, we're here to talk about sustainability. So if we're talking about sustainability, why is fishing such a big deal? Fishing is a big deal. Well, put it down into basic levels. If, if, if there's an abundance of fish in the ocean, it's a clear sign that you've got to help. And we know that fish, uh, fish responsibly, can drive a powerful economy and also ensure that people have the food they need. I and mean, that's the bottom line. The reality is uh, around 3 billion people uh, depend on fish for around 20% of their protein. And in, and in some places, it's up to 50% of their protein. It's, it's a vital resource. But there's, there's a problem, which um, I think you realize, in the sense of sustainability, we, we've got to protect this resource. Now, the data is, is not so clear going back historically. The last sort of big study done was back in 2009, but it indicated that around one in five fish coming out of the ocean were probably caught either illegally uh, or in an unreported manner. Now, this has a huge impact. Uh, this impacts on both the, the state of the fisheries because it skews the science. We don't understand how much fish is actually being taken from the ocean. So we can't make uh, proper scientific limits and therefore fish them sustainably. Uh, but it also directly impacts on people. So those people that re rely on this resource most can't get at it because it's going missing. And those that re rely on it for a food just can't get the protein replacements in the way they should. Okay, um, we got a slide that's coming up in a minute here. Um, can we have our slide up? So, this the slide shows exactly what it's. Are these all the fishing boats all over the world right now? Yeah. So this this slide is just a snapshot of activity. Um, you'll you'll see it in a moment. It's a global picture. Uh, basically, it's a heat map. You're looking at a heat map. If you drill down, you can do through the, the free and, and open website that, that Global Fishing Watch provide, you'll see around 65,000 fishing vessels. And what we've done is we've used artificial intelligence uh, to recognize when a vessel is conducting a fishing activity. So we've extracted from all of the vessels in the world just those that are fishing. Uh, we use a few different techniques, which I can explain a little bit later if need be. But the point is, until Global Fishing Watch existed, there was no global picture of, of fishing. In fact, even with 65,000 vessels in the system, it's still an incomplete picture. Many vessels uh, are just not visible to anybody. They don't have any trackers on them. And then others that really want to fish illegally will turn their trackers off or try and manipulate the data. So we use different techniques to try and find those. Okay. Now, Tony, um, right now we've, we've heard about a lot of great sustainability projects here today. And everybody's talking that uh, during COVID-19, when we had these two or three months in quarantine, a lot of us you know, had a much greater awareness of the importance of sustainability. And you and I have talked about this, but what can we do to make sure that we don't forget this. I mean, people right now, like I said at the beginning, this is the flavor of the month. But how do we make sure that it's, that awareness about sustainability continues in society? What can we do to make sure that happens? And I know that you like to talk about this as a form of resilience. How can we develop this resilience? Yeah, it's quite interesting that, that uh, such a sad thing as, as a global pandemic has actually sh shone a light on how nature, given a rest, can, can bounce back. Um, there's been some pretty iconic uh, information online through social media, seeing dolphins returning to the canals of Venice. They can, you can see they're the bottom of rivers. Even, even those of us with uh, sort of roadside gardens are seeing wildlife coming back in. So we know, given a rest, that, 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 that the environment can bounce back. But fisheries are complex. You know, there's some fish that they recover faster than others. There's some really long-lived deep water fish that take years to recover. So we shouldn't con ourselves that a few months without fishing due to COVID restrictions has given us that safety net to go fish hard again in the next uh, few months. So if we're truly going to build resilience, we have to have a system that works. The global system at the, at the moment does not work. It's very much based on proprietary data. 
people see that proprietary data as a, as a power of knowledge. But the reality is what we've done by not sharing that data is create lots and lots of electronic walls that those that want to take advantage of this broken system can do by slipping between the seams and not being caught. Even, even the science that we have at the minute tells us that we've not quite got it right. There's only 7% of fisheries in the world that are underfished. Now, a third of them are overfished. So even the system we've set up is failing us. So I think that if we're going to go forward and change what's happened over the last probably five decades, we've got to move from a system that is proprietary based into an open data system. That open data becomes more powerful because people can see what's happening. They know they're going to be watched. So there's a deterrence effect. Those fishers that think they can fish illegally will know that they'll be seen and therefore will behave differently. But the other thing, of course, here is scale. Just motorized vessels alone, there's like 2.8 million motorized vessels and, and probably another 1.2 million uh, of vessels that, that don't have motors. So understanding where all these vessels are, we, we've got to embrace techniques like AI. Uh, we've got to share the information in order that we can get it all into one place. And the only way you can really do that cost effectively, I would challenge people here, is to do it through a transparent method. Make it open data, make it clear so that we can embrace technology like Global Fishing Watch to provide a clear understanding of what's happening. So that resilience that you talk about will come from people embracing the technology in a scalable but affordable way. Okay, excellent, Tony. Um, before we end up, there's something that I think all our students and young people would really appreciate. I mean, as I said at the very beginning, it's amazing here at IE University how many projects are now about sustainability, how many projects want to give back, want to have impact. What advice do you give a student uh, that wants to do something that's sustainable, that has impact? How do you reconcile that with making money? And maybe, you know, why did you get into this? You know, what's, what's your take on money? Wow, that's a, that's a whole set of questions. Okay, so um, can you make money out of uh, saving the world? It, yes, you probably can. Um, but you need to think about how you're going to make that money. One of, one of my concerns with the way that the private sector works is it's about making that profit. So they'll use something like illegal fishing as a method for selling the product that they have in order that it is a solution to some degree, but it's only a partial solution unless it will talk to other similar systems or the data that it generates is accessible. So that really just becomes about profit and using illegal fishing as an excuse to sell the system. What we actually want is people that want to save the global um, issue here, to address the global issue. So whatever's created in working out what your uh, the, the money factor is in that it has to be scalable globally. You have to be ready to share information. You have to be able to accept that there are going to be competitors that immediately sort of follow suit. And therefore, you've got to be ready to work and just work for the greater good. So how do you connect the world? How do you scale it? How do you price it so low that people want it? Because many fishermen, especially the smaller scale fishermen, do not have a lot of money. They're subsistence fishers. So they can't afford to put thousands of dollars worth of equipment on their vessel because it's just going to eat up their profit themselves. So how do you get the price so low that people want the technology? And then how do you scale it to the point you can get a clear return? So these are big challenges. Um, one of the big areas that everybody could look at here is, is how we better engage with the small scale fishers. So these aren't the big industrial vessels that go out into the ocean, 200 miles from shore, into the high seas, indeed around the world into other people's economic zones. These are the people that come out of one port, fish for their lives, their, their own livelihood, and then go back to port. And it's extremely difficult to get, get to grips to those. So that would be my challenge to those of you out there that, that, that have that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and we have to think out of the box. It, it, I mean, there's a lot of solutions that immediately spring to mind around uh, tracking vessels, and a mobile phone data that can come back about the catch. But I suspect the actual solution hasn't even been conceived yet. And at the speed that technology moves forward, whatever happens in the next five to 10 years, there's going to be something groundbreaking and new that comes in that will change the way we can monitor fisheries. And we're sure even now 
that we can track every vessel in the world. It's just that they have to be affordable and scalable. So it'd be interesting to see where where these things uh, can move towards. Uh, in terms of why why I got into it, it's, it's kind of interesting. My, my background is not in environment. It's it's uh, it's not even in science. I'm a naval officer, and I spent most of my formative years at sea. Um, I've been in every ocean in the world. I've visited uh, most of, most well, I say you know 55 different countries uh, and seen a lot of different things happen out in the ocean, and I've got an idea of what the problem is. And I've also seen naval solutions that have dealt with things that are supposedly unsolvable, like piracy off of the Horn of Africa, where um, we had nations like Russia, Iran, Korea, China, America, the Europeans, African nations, uh, Middle Eastern nations, all working together, whereas ordinarily they don't exchange words on these sort of security matters. But they did work together to solve piracy. So I do believe there's a way of bringing all of these people together in order to solve illegal fishing, which in truth is a much bigger problem when you put it under climate change and ocean resilience. Okay, Tony, thank you very much for your time today. And I hope many of our students take your advice that they can still do good and make money at the same time. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and good luck to all of the contestants. Thank you, Tony. All right, with that, we're gonna have our closing keynote. Our closing keynote is going to be made by Maha al Uh She is the program manager of sustainability at Saudi Telecom Company. With over 19 years of experience working in the public and private sector, she's had many different roles in industry and in government. So join me in welcoming Maha, who's going to talk to us about sustainability. Maha, the floor is yours. Hi, Paris. Do you hear me? Yes, perfectly, Maha. Can you hear me, Maha? Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here uh, today. And uh, I'm talking about reshaping the narrative towards more uh, responsible business down to a sustainable future for our upcoming generation. Uh, first of all, I will I would uh, love to, to talk about the importance uh, of sustainability and why it's essential. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. We can see you now, Maha. Please, we can hear you. Uh, individuals, uh, organizations, and governments alike are all uh, increasing, uh, uh, prioritizing sustainability as an essential part of their uh, policies uh, at a time where society is becoming uh, uh, more aware of their impact on the environment. Their collective movement towards a sustainable future is leading to a huge change uh, in the corporate uh, landscape. Uh, leading global companies are showing that sustainable uh, innovation is a key uh, priority to their business models, uh, paving the way for the uh, companies uh, to uh, connect. Uh, in today's ever-evolving world, uh, debating whether to incorporate sustainability into your um, business strategy is no longer an option. Uh, considering uh, a values-driven um, approach when developing business uh, strategy can be a vital uh, to long-term uh, success. Okay. Thank you, Maha, very I much. I just want to make sure that everything is okay. Yes. Okay, moving right along. Uh, we've now come to the end of this uh, venture, uh, Virtual South Summit, and now we come for the big moment, which is when Maria Benjumea is gonna announce first the third place winner, then the second place winner, and finally the grand winner of today's competition on sustainability. Maria. Hello, Paris. 
It's been a great session. It's been a great challenge. Congratulations to all the startups because you've been really incredible. And congratulations and thank you very much to the jury. Really, it has been very dynamic and the questions, fantastic. So here comes the moment, isn't it, Paris? Yep, the big moment. I think everyone is nervous, me too. But I know them, so we are going to start with the third one, okay? And the third one is from Canada. It's Natalie from Carbon Upcycling Technologies. Way to go, Natalie. Congratulations, Natalie, congratulations. The second one, Paris, is from United Kingdom and is Natural Beats. So congrats, Giovanna. Congrats. Giovanna, auguri. And our super winner. Wait, super wait, the drums, winner, the drums. The drums. The drums. Los tambores. Los tambores. I'm going to tell you which one is. Is Biosolvit from Brazil. Guillermo. Okay, Brazil. A big applause for the third and for the super, super winner. Okay, excellent. Well, um, any closing remarks here before I um, announce next week's session, Maria? Well, I think that uh, maybe Guillermo wants to just tell us something and uh, immediately after, yes, thanks everybody. And uh, really uh, say just bye-bye uh, because we are going to see next week with the last one. But first, if you think, yes. Paris, we are going to leave Guillermo, tell us some- Guillermo, grand winner. Hi. Tell us a few things. Uh, it's amazing, amazing. I'm very, very happy and proud about being awarded. Thank you so much. Uh, congrats by the organization. Uh, it was amazing event. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you to you and congrats, Guillermo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, yes, uh, we are at the end. You are going to close it and you are going to announce the, our last, because Paris, we have arrived to our last e-challenge. It will be FinTech. And I think we are really very, we have to be very happy and we have to be very honored with the people that are coming to this session. We are going to have the closing with Carlos Torres a baby we are president and uh, he will do the closing not only talking about fintech but also closing all the different sessions that we had in virtual sun summit and we are also very honored to have adam costard from nasdaq and i think that his point of view is going to be really great for the for the ecosystem, the whole ecosystem and the economy in general. So thank you to everybody. Uh, I think that each day more people you are connected through our networking tool. And I think that's the best way to networking, not only the ones that we are engaged by War Room, we are very proud to be partner by IE University and now we are talking about sustainability and sustainability is key also uh, in the way of doing of i university so i wait for all of you next week and it's all yours because we are so uh, we must be really proud having you there week by week because you do it paris incredible thank you very much thank you maria okay well a big hand, please, from the audience, all the thousands of people that are watching us for this incredible jury uh, that has been part of this such an important sustainability event. So with that, I'm going to close. As you heard from Maria, next week, June 3rd, the last Virtual South Summit for this year, and hopefully the last Virtual South Summit for a while to come, you know, because less, next year and hopefully in October, we're going to look forward to seeing everybody face to face. So as she said, Adam Koistal 
Senior Vice President of Listing Services, and we're very honored to have with us as well Carlos, Tor Carlos Torres Villa, the President and Executive Chairman of BBVA. You cannot miss that. It's about fintech, a very important sector and is being disrupted before COVID-19 and even more so now. We're also gonna have amazing jury members from Google, BBVA, PayPal, Accel, SoftBank, DN Capital, North Zone, Mutua, and many, many more. So from all of us to all of you, sustainability, as we said, no longer just the flavor of the month. It's part of our new reality. So fly that flag for sustainability and everything that you do and everything that surrounds us. We'll see you next week for the FinTech Virtual South Summit. Thank you. Thank you.